Hi, my name's uh, Bernie Higgins. Um, I used to work for London Fire Brigade uh, as a Deputy Assistant Commissioner. Um, I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about wildfire and some I've put new and you'll notice that I put um, apostrophes either side of new because the thinking isn't necessarily new, but I think it's not always recognised by everyone who deals with wildfires. I do have a background in firefighting from my career, as I said previously. Um, I've also worked in national resilience in the United Kingdom and worked at the UK's Fire Service College as Director of Training. So I have a good understanding of the issues, particularly around response, but also around prevention. Um, and you'll see these as we go through the agenda. So we're going to talk a little bit about the definition because it's slightly different. People's views of wildfire slightly different, perhaps. Um, look a little bit at the causes and the trends um, before we go into the response and prevention and then I'm going to end talking about a particular additive which I've been involved with which is Marine 3 fire which adds um, um, considerably to the um, firefighting aspects of, of water. So number of definitions of wildfire um, the one that I found most useful, and I would say this, wouldn't I, because I'm from the UK, um, is from the UK National Operational Guidance, which is any uncontrolled vegetation fire which requires a decision or action regarding suppression. Now, I've picked that one for two reasons, actually. Um, one, because it, it sort of encompasses what we probably um, all would see as, as wildfire. Um, some of the others would talk more about size and extent and scope. And, and as we will see that some of the wildfires, particularly in the UK, were nowhere near the size of, of some of the others across the world, um, and yet had just as, as um, big an impact on the local area. Um, but also because this really talks about a suppression and response um, rather perhaps than, than looking back a stage and looking slightly um, upstream and looking at prevention activity um, as a potential way of managing. But certainly over the time, we've seen huge wildfires, um, fairly spectacular and fairly devastating um, in Australia, California, Southern Europe. Um, and, and some of these caused huge amounts of destruction, um, not least of vegetation, but of course also of the wildlife um, of the area um, and a number of animals, particularly in Sydney, were, were, were sadly killed as a result of the, the devastating fires there a couple of years back. And of course, they have a massive impact on the economy, um, particularly if we look at what's happened this year in, in Southern Europe, the impact on um, tourism has, has been fairly significant um, and, and has forced the government to say no the rest of the country is still open we have these wildfires but we, we, we don't want to stop visitors to the rest of the country but they do have a, a massive impact and then we, we looked perhaps uh, on a smaller scale at the London wildfires we, we had probably well it was the UK's highest ever recorded temperature last year of 40 degrees and um, that caused a series of wildfires in London, one of which devastated a complete village, um, which was unheard of. And certainly in my time in 33 years as a London firefighter and have fought many um, vegetation fires, I wouldn't necessarily describe them as wildfire, but they it certainly never saw anything spread that way towards uh, a village and, and furthermore destroy it in, in fairly short time as well. Um, without the time for the fire service to get an effective stop in place. So let's have a look a little bit at the causes. Um, climate is obviously number one, uh, a global temperature rise. And of course, that sustained rise in temperature will cause perfect conditions as vegetation dries out, becomes much drier, much more liable to ignite with just the presence of some more heat. Um, and of course, the high winds that can sometimes accompany a wildfire or are just part of the, the normal climate. Um, if you do get a wildfire and you get a higher winds, that's incredibly dangerous, particularly for the responders, because the winds can change direction at very short notice and leave firefighters cut off. And we have seen, sadly, firefighter fatalities 
as well as serious injuries caused by wildfires where the wind direction has changed and caught firefighters unawares. Um, but high winds can cause fires to jump considerable distances and spread, at, at, uh, as I say, at a fairly frightening speed. Many of the heat sources, though, were introduced by human beings. And I've put a list of some of them um, there. You can see campfires and barbecues, often see notices now in, in areas of um, high fire, wildfire risk, saying no campfires, no, no barbecues, no naked flames, etc. Also seen the careless disposal of um, smoking materials, cigarettes in particular, obviously. Um, but even if you've got a very hot vape, um, just discarded onto uh, very dry vegetation, the heat from that can be enough to cause the start of a fire, which can, can very rapidly grow and spread. Um, sadly, we have seen cases of arson where people have decided to deliberately start fires. And interestingly, with this one, um, that was actually a terrorist tactic way back in 2011-12. Um, Al-Qaeda used to produce um, a, a magazine um, regularly for its followers where it talked about how they could perform acts of terrorism. And one of them was to start wildfires fairly close to um, towns and cities, knowing the economic and human impact of those as they spread towards them. So um, arson has also been a cause as has uh, hot equipment or machinery left around. So they're the main causes. There are others um, that you can look up, but these are kind of the main causes of wildfire. When we look at the trends, we can see that wildfires are increasing. Um, and the United Nations Environment Programme predicts a 14% increase by 2030. That's significant and 40%, which is pretty huge actually, by 2050. And, and the biggest increases are expected in Central Europe, of course, but the Arctic as well. Who would ever have thought that the Arctic could be a, a place where we might start to see wildfires? But of course, we're seeing that the, the ice cap is, is gradually um, defrosting and permafrost is no longer permanent. And we're seeing that um, well, you know, vegetation coming through and there will be wildfires predicted there um, in, in, in the future. Um, in the UK, wildfire has been added to the National Risk Register. Now, the National Risk Register obviously is, is those major risks to um, hum, humanity and, and humankind in the UK, as well as to the, the economy. And wildfires have now been added, which means that businesses, communities and public bodies must be prepared for wildfires and the effects of wildfires. And this is despite our efforts to try and deal with climate change. Um, it is likely that any measures to protect the environment and, and um, mitigate against climate change and reduce the impact are going to take some time to, to, to take place. So whatever happens, we are going to see an increase in temperature in the short term to medium term. We hope that that trend can be reversed, of course. Um, but it, most likely we're going to see a, a trend that increases temperatures and therefore increases the likelihood of some of the more devastating wildfires. So the response um, is relatively westernised. And, and what I mean by that is that we tend to look at wildfires as an avoidable risk. They're not like other natural, naturally occurring disasters and phenomena such as earthquakes or volcano eruptions, which are just seen as almost an act of God, almost a, a, something that you can't avoid. But we see fire as, as an avoidable risk. Um, and, and we tend to see it, uh, uh, is, that we need to legislate, therefore, um, uh, to try and prevent the wildfires. And, and that legislation, as I mentioned earlier, tends to take the form of laws to pre uh, prevent use of ignition sources, such as barbecues, campfires, smoking materials. But in other countries, um, they've learned to live with the threat of fire. So in places like Brazil, Venezuela, Guyana, wildfire is actually seen as a natural aid. It's actually seen as something which can help um, to, to preserve the ecosystem health and stimulate fresh growth. The problem, as they see it, is when the wildfire outgrows the ecosystem. So therefore, it's so big and so intense 
that actually it outgrows that ecosystem. Therefore, it, it makes regeneration um, uh, and stimulation for, for the, the ecosystem less likely going forward, or certainly will take a lot longer. So maybe we need to look a little bit at that and say, well, we're going to need to learn to live with wildfires. They are a fact of life and no amount of legislation is actually going to stop them. So how can we work with wildfire and how can we plan wildfire so that actually it does have that regenerative response? It does stimulate new growth. It does help to protect and preserve ecosystems whilst not doing damage to wildlife, etc., and causing both economic and human suffering. So this is really focused, my main message here is around prevention. Um, and I've put their partnership approach because the multi-agency planning for wildfire is absolutely key. And if you're going to get involved in this, you need to start now. By now you should have enough data in, in um, most communities to identify the places most at risk from wildfire, whether that be at risk because they've had numerous wildfires before, or even whether it's at risk because you have, as you can see on the screen, the picture from the, the wildfires in East London, you have small villages, small settlements of people very close to areas likely to be affected by wildfire. So we need to do a risk assessment if that hasn't already been done and establish during that who is most threatened. Is it people? Is it property? Is it wildlife? Is it the vegetation and the ecosystem? And then start to look at plans to mitigate that risk um, by reducing the spread. So accepting that wildfire will happen, but doing everything in your power to reduce the spread of that wildfire when it happens. And the sort of activity we're looking at there are a kind of not just pre-planning, um, we talk a little bit about creating fire breaks, but it's also around not just local laws, but also perhaps local patrols, people walking around. So whether that's the people who own the land, whether that's local communities going to be affected, starting to have regular patrols to, to, to have a look and see how the land is coping and whether it is likely to be at serious risk, and then reporting that so that something can be done before the hot weather strikes and before that, uh, that that wildfire really takes a hold. The fire breaks themselves, as I've said, they need to be as wide as possible. And you need to think then about what's the local climate, how likely is it we're going to have high winds as well as these dry conditions, and then cut the fire break accordingly. But you can also do things like adding an additive um, onto a fire break to try and further or, or either side of the fire break in fairly wide swathes to try and prevent ignition in the first place or that fire from breaking out from the fire break and, and um, spreading further. So the way you would do that is to apply the additive proactively before the fire is likely to start um, in, a, in an effort to suppress and at least delay the, the further outbreak of, of fire and stop that spread from getting uh, so wide that it that, that it just becomes impossible to recover properly from. The fire services need to work with multi-agency planning groups and their firefighters know their patches well. The local communities, the local people in those will know their areas well and they should all be working together now in the quieter months, in the in the perhaps the colder months for most parts of the globe, um, to enable um, the, the prevention work to take place before we get into the wildfire season. So certainly work should be started now in Australia because the wildfire season is, is not far away for them. So we need to start working together. Um, and that may mean perhaps in terms of response, putting some perhaps some containers full of um, firefighting water and additive together that fire, fire services can easily tap into. Perhaps it does mean putting stuff out there and you can, they don't have to be ugly blots on the landscape. They can be made to blend in, but you should, we should be thinking now more about can we put something in there so that firefighters can not only respond quickly to the areas where they know they can get easy access, but they can also then connect up their, their hoses and equipment quickly and have a ready water supply with additive to try and deal with the wildfire as quickly as possible. 
And the last point on there is around community preparedness. Now, that involves two things. One, the community being well informed of their risks, well informed of what to look for, but also the warning and informing so that as and when a wildfire breaks out, the communities are aware, are told and are able to make better plans for taking action should that really be necessary. Because despite everything we do, there is still the possibility that a wildfire will get out of control. It will spread further than fire breaks and planned areas perhaps of burning. And, and um, therefore, um, they need to be ready to take action uh, should that be the case. So that's kind of the a real snapshot, an overview of where we are with wildfires, what the impacts can be, but also what we can do to try and prevent wildfires occurring in the future. And I just want to spend the last little part of this just talking a little bit about a particular um, firefighting additive, which is this one, um, Marine 3 Fire. There's quite a lot of information on that screen, I know. I'll leave you to read the white box at your leisure. Um, as we know from our elementary um, chemistry, uh, the triangle of fire involves um, fuel, heat and oxygen. And water is very effective at removing the heat, cooling the fire. Additives help the water to penetrate and soak into something, as well as making the water almost sticky. It used to be years ago, it used to be called sticky water um, because it keeps the water, it stops, stops it just running off and, and running away without having too much of a cooling effect and make sure it sticks around long enough to have a really good cooling effect. So the Mosmark product, the Marine 3 as it's known, um, is biodegradable, um, it's worldwide patented, but it's also been tested and CE certified for use in all Class A fires. Um, suppresses and extinguishes fires faster than water alone. And we did some tests, which you will see at the Fire Service College. Um, we did these tests some, some years back. Um, and you will see that they're quite impressive results from comparing water alone to water with an additive with Marine 3 fire. We've also found more recently that it can be used as a fire retardant. So you can proactively apply it to vegetation and uh, or thatch, and it will prevent a fast spread of fire. So we, we applied it to a haystack, um, applied a blowtorch, and the untreated haystack immediately caught fire, as you'd expect. Um, the treated haystack took considerably longer. It did eventually catch fire, because it will, um, but it took considerably longer um, than the untreated one to actually ignite and therefore start to spread. So we know it can be used as a fire retardant on vegetation or thatch. Just a little bit about what uh, Marine 3 does. Uh, increases the penetration of water, so it allows it to really get in. So it's very effective on, on open vegetation, on dry grass, on straw, on hay. Um, also very, very good on waste fires as well. Um, because it keeps the water in that place and doesn't allow it just to quickly run off, there is a reduced runoff, reduced evaporation, which increases the cooling effect of the water. Um, it is eco-friendly, it's non-toxic, and of course that is crucial. Um, there are additives on the market, there are foams on the market which are not um, eco-friendly. And as time goes on, we will see some of the ones with PFAS in them, which is a particularly um, enduring chemical. We will see those phased out over the coming uh, short term period. Um, there's no PFAS in Marine 3. Um, it's eco friendly. It's non toxic. And as we said before, it can can work very, very effectively as a retardant to um, fires on in open wildfires and, and fires on open land and vegetation. I've just put this code up, this, that QR code will give you links to a number of different fires so that you can see that we don't just say it'll do these things, we can back it up. These were tests undertaken at the Fire Service College um, in the UK um, a few years back. So that's the end of the presentation been great to have this opportunity but it's time to stop the talking and start the action so number one just as a recap get together start planning let's start trying to do something where we work with 
fire as a phenomenon to encourage um, regrowth, to encourage the preservation of um, the unique biosystems out there, and to start planning our response so that fire services, firefighters have a better and safer opportunity to put out fires quickly and not allow them to become these huge fire fronts, which can take days and sometimes weeks to extinguish and, and cause fire service difficulties, both with safety, but also um, in terms of using up resources, which then can't respond elsewhere because they need to deal with a huge fire, which is threatening the local area. Thank you. Our contact details are on the screen. Thoroughly enjoy doing this presentation. Well, thank you, Bernie, for another incredibly topical presentation on wildfires. And it's a topic that has plagued the firefighting community globally over recent years, especially this year with obviously Nova Scotia, Greece and Hawaii. Um, so just to start us off, could you give us a little insight into why you wanted to talk about this topic today? Uh, that's a great question. Thanks, Rebecca. And thank you again for inviting me back. Um, uh, the reason for it is, is, as you say, we've seen some devastating wildfires over recent years. And although we have lived with wildfires for quite some time, we're seeing they're having a more significant impact on the environment. And they certainly seem to me at least to be a new threat, certainly in the UK, um, because of that, that intensity that, that um, global warming uh, is adding to, so the, the changes in, in climate are adding to the, 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 the they're adding to the, um, to the existing threat of, of wildfire. So, I think this is going to be a growing trend that we're going to see and therefore I think it's important that we start to think differently about how we can prevent and work with wildfire. Well agreed, it makes perfect sense. And um, you also mentioned a hot vape being one of the causes of wildfires and this is a slightly new challenge uh, with stories of vape batteries exploding or catching fire kind of all over the place really. Um, has this caused increased challenges for firefighters? Without a doubt, I think if you if you widen that out to lithium batteries, whether that's in vapes or whether that's in um, scooters, mobility um, aids, etc., or indeed in electric vehicles, it's a new phenomenon because, of course, the the the, the chemistry of combustion within a lithium iron cell is very different to normal combustion. The fact it's got an outer shell on it makes it difficult to put out. So yes, vapes in particular, in this particular regard, it's around people just using it and then just tossing it away and not thinking that actually um, that battery can um, can actually, um, particularly if it's left in the sun, that can be enough to cause that battery. We often talk about exploding, but basically the cell goes into thermal runaway and that will undoubtedly cause um, at the start of a fire. Now, whether it grows into a wildfire, of course, depends on what's around it. But it's definitely a new risk that we're seeing um, uh, throughout d different aspects of, of um, society. Mm. Well, hopefully they're going to have some kind of regulations come into place with the banning of those that we'll start to see come to fruition soon. Um, and just out of curiosity, um, obviously you mentioned about the lithium ion batteries being in lots of different types of products. Um, is it the same, obviously, considering the different size of a vape considering uh, in comparison to a scooter or an electric vehicle like you mentioned, is the, is the difficulty in putting it out still the same, but on a smaller scale? Um, slightly easier to put out, to be honest, because there's, there's not so many cells in there in which the, the propagation can then spread to. So it's certainly easier to put out, but the heat output and the fact that um, particularly with a vape, if it, if it does actually explode, um, there's still going to be fragments, which is still going to cause nasty injuries. Of course, the bigger the battery, the more cells you have in the battery, the more difficult it is to put out. And also the, 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 the greater the risk of serious injury. Mm. And you also mentioned the wildfires in London last year. Uh, do you think there needs to be a change in training or equipment across fire departments so that, you know, if you take London Fire Brigade, for example, who are obviously well versed in structural fires um, and perhaps high rise firefighting tactics, um, 
would the training equipment help better equip them to deal with wildfires as they're becoming obviously more common and also resources from multiple different fire departments are being called on internationally uh, to help prevent the spread of large wildfires? Um, you're absolutely right, Rebecca. In fact, I know London Fire Brigade has already started training and, and it's it's interesting how we're now looking much wider. The world is a far more connected place. So I know that London, for example, is going up to Northumberland and training some of their tactical advisors in wildfires using the expertise that's in Northumberland, which has extensive experience of dealing with wildfire. Um, but actually some UK fire services are now looking abroad and going down to Spain and places like that to get their training um, so that we're, they're, they're much better prepared. It's still that westernised view of response. So we are seeing new equipment is coming on board. We're seeing um, all terrain vehicles being used now for for um, wildfire in particular. And we're also seeing um, what was called holy hose and holy is spelled as in H-O-L-E-Y, um, which is basically hose with a number of pinholes in and you charge the hose up and that it, it, it brings water out um, in, in smaller pinhole little tiny jets, mm. which can help to cool. All of these are really good and they show that the, the fire service in the UK is taking the threat very seriously. Um, in terms of national resilience, um, I'd like to see wildfire added as a national resilience um, capability so that fire services can support each other when they have wildfires um, as they can now um, for many other threats and and they can bring those specialist um, that specialist equipment that specialist knowledge to bear so perhaps at a time when um, budgets are reducing fire services will need to collaborate much much more and that's one good way of doing it is via that national resilience mechanism I think. Mm. I think definitely, I think that um, that nod towards communication and collaboration is something that's so important in the firefighting community. And also the every every fire department, every region suffers from different challenges. And actually the difficulties you might be having in a renewed challenge in, in the UK, for example, might be common occurrence for somebody in the US. So to learn from each other's experiences, often you can find the answers there. So it makes perfect sense to actually collaborate properly and actually have a wider talking community. And it's something that the fire industry is quite good at, to be fair. Um, so um, hopefully we can, we can see that come to fruition. And um, you also spoke about uh, local patrols, and I think that's a very interesting take on a prevention method. And it reminds me slightly of how we designate, obviously, a responsible person now to ensure appropriate best practice and maintenance in a building to prevent fire. Um, and it makes sense, obviously, to apply similar prevention strategies that we do in the passive fire prevention to wildfires. Um, how could we actually enact this sort of method? I think here what, what I was getting at was, was maybe volunteers to do some of that. It may be that you would use local fire services. for So it may be that volunteer part-time firefighters, that may be a potential role uh, to add to their remit. Um, but it may also be local volunteers from the area. So um, we know that in particular, in most countries, certainly the UK, there are uh, there's quite a significant community of people who care about the climate, who care about the environment. And we should be tapping into those sorts of people to see if we can get some volunteers who've got sufficient training and awareness, and that would be something you'd need to provide, of course, that they can go out and do that role to, to keep an eye on their environment and raise the alarm early that actually look, this area now looks prone, we're likely to have a wildfire, we need to be prepared. What can we do together to try and, if there is going to be a fire here, that we restrict it in, in area? So I, I think, as you rightly say, Rebecca, I think there's some useful lessons learned from the built environment, the responsible person that, that could easily be transferred over here. The key will be, and this will be the difficult bit, I guess, is who's actually the person that's responsible for an open area of land. I guess somewhere down the line, someone will own it, whether that's the National Trust, whether that's a local development or whether that's um, a private landowner. And, and it'll be for that person really to to make sure that their particular part of land is, is well protected. Um, and also that they can help to prevent the, 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 the larger growth and spread of wildfires.
And I think as well, obviously, you're you're typically, I suppose, more likely to see wildfires in, in large areas of vegetation, so your villages and your surrounding areas. Um, and I think the, the types of community, the types of people that live in those areas are often walking the countryside, walking their dogs, you know, uh, you know, all of that and, and in that vegetation anyway. So I think finally a volunteer, just someone to when they go for their daily walk to keep an eye yes. out to go, oh, there's a uh, a fallen tree over there which is you know dried out and you know anything that you know that can happen like that so I think it should be something that that on paper um, is is easy to do but um, I, would, I would like to see it actually you know come about I think that'd be quite important. Could, could I just and, say Rebecca I'd, I'd join two things you've, you've got a really good point there you know you can join things together so it's proven that actually getting out and walking in nature is actually really good for mental health and well-being. So maybe there is a join up there for local communities and say, look, not only get your sort of an hour or 40 minutes, 30 minutes exercise, but while you're doing it, do some good for the local mm -hmm. area and just have a look. I really like to see things join together so you're not just doing one thing. No, definitely. And uh, as as a, a proud owner of three boisterous dogs um i'm often you know every, every day we're, we're walking out in the countryside i'm very fortunate to live in a village in kent so i've got you know miles of of countryside across the street from me so we're often walking there and you know even you know last night i was walking the dogs and there's about you know four or five fallen trees that are you yeah. know blocking the paths or in the woods or you know falling in a field or something like that and it's just those little things of putting the dots together putting two and two and actually going well this, this should be you know maintained and just just in case um so it's a, yeah it's an interesting method so i think it's definitely something that we would be quite fortunate to see um come to light and um right. anyway lastly you spoke about um you spoke a bit about the sustainability benefits of marine three um a bit of an obvious question i suppose but how important is it to implement environmentally friendly foams and additives in firefighting i think it's vital rebecca and it's <clears throat> it's actually a really good question because um Traditionally, we've almost seen this a trade-off, and we've said, well, you know, that, that that some of the runoff from fire may be that, but actually the products of fire are worse than that. Therefore, there's a trade-off. Therefore, we carry on. And I understand that. And in fact, as uh, as a as a relatively senior person, I used to be in the fire service. Um, uh, you know, we, we used to use that, and and I was one of the people who said, well, we need to put the fire out. Um, and that's true. It's still true. However. Um, the more we understand about the effects and the causes of climate change, the more we understand about how we should be protecting the environment, the less I believe there's a case for saying, well, even if it causes a little bit of pollution, it prevents more. And I think we're duty bound to investigate and say, well, if you are going to put these fires out, which we want you to do still, or I would hope people do anyway, um, that you need to find a way of doing so without damaging the environment. So I think sustainability in whatever additive, whether that's replacements for foams that have got um, PFAS, PFAS in them, um, or indeed it's it's additives and making sure that those additives do not contain um, toxic or damaging chemicals. I think we're duty bound to do that. And and the one thing I've always known for, for throughout my life is that you know when you get human beings together to work on an issue and say we want something that does this but doesn't do that we're brilliant as uh, you know as humankind of coming up with those really innovative solutions and i think sustainability within firefighting is going to become a bigger and bigger and bigger issue whether that's the fire kit you wear the appliance you go out in or indeed the additives i think we're going to have to see over the life cycle of a product or something that's used that we are looking at sustainability for, for the materials and, and the supply chain within it. And I think it's a um it's a the 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 comment you made about kind of well you know we're putting out the fire so you know we've got a little leeway when it comes to sustainability. And like you said, although true, but it ends up being a vicious cycle because the more we harm the environment, the more or we have um climate crisis related challenges like wildfires. Um so obviously you kind of have to fight both ends um, to get a positive result. And I think, you know, with, there's so many innovations on the market that do you have PFAS free foams, you know, whether it's Marine 3 or, or you know, FromTech, for example, um, that 
we we kind of getting to a point where we might not have an excuse anymore except for maybe specific niche areas like hazmat for example but in terms of like your your general firefighting um we've got the solutions there so we need to make sure that we're applying them and like you said i think sustainability doesn't just come down to environmentally free friendly foams um but it also comes down to you know the building materials we use um yes. to construct what's the point in in building a, a home that if it does catch fire it's completely 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 gone um, and creates you know, more challenges to the climate or um, yeah, other, other fire safety related things as well. So I think sustainability is definitely coming in to all areas of the fire industry and we need to be paying more attention to that kind of major theme. Um, and yeah, anyway. I completely agree with Rebecca and, and the time is now. We, we can't say we'll put it off and we'll do it in a couple of years, two or three years. We need to start now. My, my view of the climate emergency, as, as I think it is, is our generation is the last one that has a chance to have an impact um and i would hate it to be that future generations look back on us and say you had the opportunity and you didn't take it and i think we have to take that opportunity i would i can't imagine what the world will be like if it becomes inhospitable for human beings mm -hmm. but it won't be very pleasant and i think we need to do everything we can across all the industries now Definitely. And I think also the motto of uh, kind of, you know, every little helps. Um, it's not just, you know, a lot of people have the mindset of, well, you know, me not giving, not doing a ride share, for example, a car ride share on the way to work is not really going to harm the environment. And it doesn't in the grand scheme of things, but actually just contributing that little bit extra. And if everybody's contributing that little bit extra, you know, you start to see a you know a big change and that's how we can you know actually come together and that comes with all industries not just fire you know and it comes to us individually and professionally um so i think that's quite a good note to end on so thank you bernie i really appreciate your time as always as a fire by line veteran um and if anybody has any further questions please don't hesitate to reach out to bernie on the platform thank you